Mike Loveday had been a sheriff's deputy in Knoxville, Tennessee for more than four years. He was well aware of the dangers of his job. But on April 4th, 1988, his own personal safety was the furthest thing from his mind. It was Easter Sunday morning, and Mike had been on midnight shift. And he came in about 6.30 in the morning, went to bed, and my son and I got up around 8, went into the living room, so not to disturb Mike. Are you excited about going to Nanny's for Easter? Yeah. <laughs> Becky? Becky? Are you okay? He was sitting up, he was in a cold sweat, just shaking, and I said, I said, what's wrong, what's wrong? He said, oh, nothing, I, I've just had a bad dream. He said, I'm going to go back to sleep, you know, wake me up in a little while. Are you sure you're all right? When he told me he had a bad dream, it scared me. He, he never has bad dreams like that. He's never hollered out in the middle of the night or while he's been resting or anything. And so off and on during the course of the day, I'd asked him what his dream was about, and he didn't want to talk about it. He, you know, I'll tell you later, he kept putting me off like that. That night, Mike went to work, and he called me around midnight. I was talking to him and convinced him to tell me about his dream. And he told me that he had dreamed that I had gotten killed in a car wreck and that it was all over the TV and newspaper. Well, he told me he would talk to his captain, try to come home around 2. So we hung up the phone, and I just, I just had this real bad feeling that something was going to happen, you know, that it's just an instinct or gut feeling that, Something bad, you know, is about to happen. A short while later, Mike met up with fellow officer and friend Ed Cummings. Been raining a little bit. We were sitting there just chit chatting, and we get a lot of speeders there. I mean, we've clocked them doing some of them doing over 100 miles there down the hill, and it's just 45 mile in our speed zone. I don't know whether Mike dropped his radio or what happened. The dispatcher came back two or three times and asked him, Mike, you know, tag number or further description or the location or whatever. Well, Mike never did. So I got on the radio. Breaker 11, that's 10 4. I'm behind Breaker 18. No pipe there. We're being advised right now. Do you have a tag number? I said, can't get a tag number because you can't see. Rescue units were immediately dispatched to the scene. I thought he was dead from the way it looked. Mike! Mike! I can't get the doors open. The doors are jammed where the rear end is shoved up into the doors door glass is not broke and here I am Mike. trying to hit them Mike. break them and they won't break so I could get in and just at least drag him out before it, the car catches on fire it was just an unbelievable feeling you know one of your friends there and you can't get him out of the car and before it blows up Mike. 
Can you hear me? Hurry up the rescue squad. I got to get him out of here. Factory Raven, they're in route to you. I couldn't have been there more than a couple of minutes and these two guys from a nearby wrecking company that had been monitoring the police radio stopped by. Get a crowbar! Right in here! Crowd right in here! Uh -oh. Keep working, keep working, keep working! The only thing holding him up was his seatbelt. Can you hear me? And I could see that he wasn't breathing. I was there to help, but I was helpless. And it was very frustrating. Word of a fellow officer in trouble sent sheriff's deputies rushing to his aid. A fire rescue unit arrived within three minutes. When the fire department arrived on the scene, they immediately came out with big long pry bars and was tearing the doors off to try to get to him. If they had to break a window to get Mike out, they might risk injuring him further. Bobby McBee was among the first paramedics on the scene. When I first saw Mike, uh, the way he was slumped over and in the position he was in, and from the looks of the car, I was almost positive it was a hopeless situation that we would just be recovering a body. Just frustrating trying to get him out of the vehicle because you want to do it instantaneously and it doesn't happen that fast. There we go. All right. All right. We found uh, Mike to be alive. We immediately started our ABCs, which is our airway breathing and circulation. His respirations were just going downhill fast. He was going from breathing about 18 to 20 times a minute down to 10 or less. There was a spare tire from what I figured came from his trunk laying in what was left of the back seat. I pretty much surmised that, you know, he must have received a massive blow. I was uh, constantly concerned that he was going to stop breathing or die in the car and there wouldn't be a whole lot I could do for him while he was in the car. So I was just really wanting to get him out of that vehicle as quick as I could. In my mind, they took him away. I thought, you know, he's dead. Next time I see him, he'll be asked at the funeral home. The phone rang, and I thought, now, this is bad. I didn't say hello or anything. I just said, what's wrong? And the lady on the other line from dispatch, she said, is Officer Mike Loveday your husband? I said, yes, he is. And she said, well, he's been involved in a serious car wreck, and you better get to UTER immediately. And all I could think about was the dream he had. And I thought, you know, well, it's come true, but not for me, but for him. Mike was in a coma when he was admitted to the emergency room under the care of Dr. Blaine Anderson. We knew that he had a head injury. We didn't know how severe that head injury was. And we weren't sure of what other injuries he might have going on. So I certainly, when he first arrived, felt that he may have sustained injuries that he could die from. The nurse came into the waiting room and handed me Mike's wedding band. And I just looked at it. I said, where's Mike? What is wrong with Mike? And she said, just sit down. Be calm. The doctor will be with you in a minute. I just felt like, like I was powerless, that I couldn't do anything for him. You know, I wanted to make everything okay, but I couldn't. Well, when I saw him lying there, it was like, like it was me laying there. Other than Benjamin, our son, he was, he was my life and. No, I just felt helpless, like there was nothing I could do. He was just lifeless. I was scared to death that he was going to die. I kept 
telling him, Mike, I love you. So I love you, Mike. I said, you're going to be okay. And he squeezed my hand. Each time he squeezed my hand, that gave me a ray of hope that I knew he was going to be okay. After four days in a coma, Mike Loveday regained consciousness. He had a head injury from which he could have had permanent disability. But I think because of the care that he received in the field, the initial care that he received here, his rehab care, and especially because of the support that he had at home, that he has made a, a complete recovery. It took a year and a half of therapy, but Mike has fully recovered from the accident. And he and his wife, Becky, have become the parents of a baby girl. The road for my recovery was very difficult. But I maintained a positive attitude every day. I wanted to get better. I wanted to come back to work. I pushed myself to do 110% every day. If my therapist told me to do something and my therapist wasn't pr pleased with my results or if I wasn't pleased with it, we'd do it again until I felt like I, was, uh, I had given my all. The driver of the black Mustang was found guilty of reckless driving and resisting arrest and sentenced to two days in jail. The love days have gone on with their lives. Until something bad happens, you take things for granted. You think, oh, that'll never happen to me. You know, just like, you know, I never thought anything like this would ever happen to us. But it, it does. But now he's, he's fine. Matter of fact, I like him better. <laughs> I love him better because of, I guess, everything we've went through. <laughs>